to begin by uh, thanking the Breakthrough Initiative for having me here. So I'll be talking about a few disparate topics that uh, Professor Loeb and I have looked at. So this, this work was done in collaboration with him. And uh, so first, I'm just going to start with a brief overview, which sort of overlaps with some of the talks we've already seen. So um, as we've seen, um, it's very important to identify biosignatures and signs of life, and also to identify signs of advanced civilization, namely technosignatures on um, different planets. So um, as people have pointed out, the most conventional strategy is to look for to detect the presence of life is to look for chemical disequilibrium. This goes back to the 60s, at least, an idea. And so that means we look for you know, gases um, like oxygen and methane in the atmosphere. So it's also possible that other features, such as vegetation, oceans, et cetera, might be detected. So we, we sort of heard from Professor Meadows about the glint effect, for instance, which can be used to detect oceans. So, uh, and of course, uh, people have also pointed out the importance of false positives that might mimic biosignatures. So, uh, let's, let me just begin briefly by looking at what the Galileo probe told us. So, in 1990, I think, the Galileo mission flew by the Earth, and uh, in, in a very uh, interesting paper by Stegen et al., they sort of reported some of the features that were found during a flyby mission of the Earth. So firstly, they found that oxygen and methane were at levels much higher than what one would expect from thermodynamic equilibrium. Secondly, they found that there was a sharp increase in the reflectance um, in the red part of the whisper spectrum. This corresponds to the red edge of vegetation, which I'll discuss in more detail a bit later. And then lastly, they found narrow band pulse amplitude modulated signals, and uh, taken collectively, uh, Sagan et al. argued that this constituted uh, pretty compelling evidence for life and that to intelligent life on the planet. And as Dr. Tartar pointed out, probably the most unambiguous signature of life was actually the techno signature, namely the radio signals that came from ocean liners. So I'm going to move to the first of the three disparate things that I'll be covering, namely breakthrough, breakthrough star shot as seen from other stars. So, as we know, the aim of breakthrough star shot is to accelerate a gram-sized spacecraft to one-fifth the speed of light. So, and, so this, and at this stage, it is important to remember that in the past couple of years, there have been papers that have pointed out the fact that leakage arising from the light sail propulsion systems are very much safety detectable. So this includes work by Gilleshun and Loeb, Benford and Benford, Lubin, and so on. And uh, so I, I want to make the following point. So if civilizations have not been able to detect the Earth's natural leakage radiation, they, they might be able to re detect the leakage arising from the light sails used in the Starshot mission. So there's been a lot of discussion in the community about the benefits and the risks of active safety. So uh, in, you know, in, using the star, in uh, going ahead with the Starshot mission, this is an important issue that we should be potentially bearing in mind. So this is the first part of the talk. And the second thing I want to talk about is natural and artificial spectral edges. And um, so yeah, so as we've heard, photosynthesis is, you know, it's a pretty ubiquitous phenomenon on Earth, and it relies on harvesting stellar energy. And uh, so the reason we sort of see a sharp increase in the reflectance is because most of the organisms absorb light at wavelengths that are close to the peak incident photon flux, although there are some other factors involved as well. And this gives rise to the distinctive spectral feature called the red edge, which I'll show you in the next slide. So it's possible that on other stars, such as M dwarf, where most of the radiation is in the infrared, the red edge may be also shifted into infrared wavelength. So just as people, Sagan et al. You know, described the presence of a red edge during the flyby mission, we might be able to find something similar during a flyby of Proxima b or other such star. So this brings me to the following point. Um, in many cases, our own technology has relied on ideas from nature and adapted them accordingly. The example of flight is of course a classic one. So it's also possible that advanced civilization, which are planet bound, may decide in order to meet their energy needs, they may decide to uh, adopt a similar strategy 
to photosynthesis. In other words, they might uh, decide to sort of go for an artificial form of photosynthesis or some other means of tapping into stellar energy. So let me show you uh, the spectra of the, um, the reflection for different materials. The one in green is for an oak leaf. And you can see there's a very sharp rise in the reflectance at around 0.7 micrometers, and that corresponds to the red edge. The curve in black is silicon. The curve in um, red is germanium. And the one in blue is perovskite. So all of these are photovoltaic materials. But one can also construct similar uh, reflectance curves for materials that are used, for example, in artificial photosynthesis, photocatalysis, and so on. And in all of them, one can expect to find, uh, fairly, you know, again, distinctive spectral edges. So this is also um, a feature that we should bear in mind when carrying out a flyby mission, that there might be uh, civilizations which are relying on harnessing stellar energy to meet their energy needs. So how do we distinguish between the two cases? Well, one means is if we can uh, look at the photographs of the planet, and if we are ideally able to resolve up to the scale of kilometers, it's possible that we might be able to find these structures directly. If not, we can think of a tidally locked planet where you have a silicon coating, and uh, you might want to transfer heat and light from the day side to the night side. And if we find that there are signs of anomalous heat and light redistribution, that is more than what one would expect from atmospheres and from um, and from oceans, this might un be another sign that there is uh, some form of artificial activity going on. And uh, now I come to the last part of my talk, and this is panspermia. So panspermia is the process, a hypothesized mechanism by which life is transferred from one planet to another, typically by means of rock. So as we've seen, the recently discovered TRAPPIST-1 system as between three to four planets in the habitable zone. And um, so it's uh, so the, uh, interesting feature about uh, multi-planetary systems in the habitable zone around Nemdros is that the habitable zone is very narrow compared to that around G-type stars like the sun. And therefore, if there are multiple planets, they're all going to be very close together. And this could increase the chances of panspermia by a few orders of magnitude. Most of this increase would potentially arise from the fact that the transit time from one planet to another are much shorter than, for example, the Earth to Mars case. So from Earth to Mars, the average time scale is around 10 million years, whereas we've sort of suggested that it could be anywhere between two to four orders of magnitude lower. Now, can we hope to really detect panspermia, especially during a flyby mission? Perhaps not, because we know that evolution is very complex, so there's both convergent and divergent evolution. So you can start off from two very close points and the trajectories could diverge. Alternatively, they could evolve independently but also converge towards the same point. But having said that, we could try and look for certain features in common between multiple planets, such as trying to see where the red edge is located and perhaps if we can find any multicellular tree-like life forms and see whether they have the same structure. And uh, therefore, oh, sorry. And therefore, to summarize, from the viewpoint of signatures, we can hope to try and look for any modulated radio or optical signals. And if we can get resolution down to kilometer scales, we can try to look for artifacts on the planet's surface. And of course, if we are passing by in the neighborhood and we encounter any mega structures, that may also be possible. So um, as, as I've noted, um, many organisms on Earth rely on harvesting light through photosynthesis. And it's possible that advanced civilizations might rely on similar methods to try and harness stellar energy. And they can be distinguished from their natural counterparts by looking, trying to look at the surface directly or trying to look at anomalous heat and light redistribution. And lastly, panspermia could be operational on uh, closely packed uh, multi-planetary systems such as TRAPPIST-1. However, uh, we, at least for other planetary systems, it may not be possible to find uh, you know, uh, conclusive evidence for uh, its existence just from a flyby mission. Thank you.
We'll take a couple of questions. Jim? Uh, let me suggest a way to uh, look for panspermia mm -hmm. remotely. It's recently been shown that you can determine remotely the mm -hmm. uh, chirality of mm -hmm. organic molecules. Right, right. So if you fly by and you see another chirality, mm -hmm. then it, it ain't panspermia. Right. And that's a remote detection. Mm -hmm. It's not just a biosignature, it's, it's a signature of biochemistry. Right. Yeah, I th yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Of course, there are two possible states, and yeah. so yeah. even you know if they are not correlated, they might still be the same. Yeah. Right. Um, let's take a question over there. So the probability of panspermia happening in any given system is going to depend also on the initial impact onto the planet lifting mm -hmm. the yeah. material out to then transfer to the next body. So the probability of panspermia depends on where the debris belts are in the system as well, and not just where the planets are. Right. Have you given any thought to what the, the likely position of, say, a debris belt might be in systems like TRAPPIST? And do we have any evidence to back this up yet? Um, that's obviously a very good point, and we did think about it. But um, so, you know, when people have done calculations in our own solar system, they take into impact, uh, sorry, they take into account the, imp the cratering rate and therefore the impact of, you know, uh, meet asteroids and then trying to figure out how much rocky material is ejected and so on. And um, since at least we don't seem to have enough data, so we sort of just mentioned that it's a big unknown and sort of left it at that. But that's a very good point. So that is one of the many factors that we don't know. There's also the fact that you need life on one planet for, to, for it to spread to others. And then we also need to know if microorganisms can, on, on these alien organisms can survive the transit and so on. Also because TRAPPIST is quite active and there's going to be a lot more flares. So there's quite a few unknowns. So what we tried to do was to quantify that which can be quantified and you know, um, the, the rest can't be done. 